Hello, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to Sons of Ours podcast. My name is Ian Wintering. And my name is Tony Davis. That's right. Not Micah Flores. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I'm not trying to take over. So I've been in the past like four or five episodes. Uh, you know, I, We're I did notice that. supposed to be switching that. out. I did notice that. And my mom even noticed that. But I wasn't going to say anything <laughs> to you. I figured just let Ian take the wheel. Well, um, yeah, it's just it just keeps working out that way. I'm not trying to take over or anything. I promise. <laughs> But it's okay. I am more than happy to share some responsibility in this place. So uh, it's great. Seminary is an awesome place like for us to take initiative, but sometimes we just kind of get bogged down and, and busy. So it's it's pretty cool to see, like, you know, I listened to your guys' podcast, and I'm like, man, that was really good. Like, I wish I could do that. And I'm like, oh, wait, I, I do <laughs> I'm do supposed that. to be doing that next week. Yeah, like, dang it. I should, <laughs> I should probably prepare something, you know? <laughs> so it is pretty cool. I listened to your guys' podcast last week. Uh, with with Matt Christians and that's right learn more about Matt on that podcast so um, it was really beautiful I love I love listening to my brothers I just I mean you'd think because we live together and we eat lunch and dinner and breakfast together like we'd know more about each other but most of the time we're just so busy we're so we're you know thinking about classes or apostle or whatever it is that we don't actually end up talking at meals about you know my past history or this or that it's like no we end up talking about the food that's in front of us or the weather, you know, small talk because our brains are so fried that we're just, no, let's just, you know, let's just shoot, shoot the breeze here and, and hang out as brothers. And so right. it's, it's right. relieving, but a lot of times, unless you live with a guy um, in one of our small households that we have here, you don't actually get to know each other super well. Um, so I'm, I'm super thankful that I get to hear a little bit on the podcast and, and get to know guys a little more. Yeah. Actually, and speaking of which, yes, we have a very, very special guest today. We do. I call him a man of mystery. But yes, yes, very much so. He's also special. He is also known as the Stang. Stanginator. The Stangalang. Stang monkey. Yes, it is Mr. Most Mr. John Stang. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That is exactly what I expected from him. <laughs> yeah, so John, I have known him for four years now, and by know him, I've never lived with him. We were not in the same spirituality or class. So my experience of John Stang is our activities, various lunch conversations, but very little. Yeah. I don't actually know much about John Stang. Other than that, I am guaranteed to laugh anytime I talk to him, um, and I'm also guaranteed to learn something new about either him or life or somebody else. <laughs> like right. <it> just, <laughs> he always has some insight that is just witty and, and ready to go. Yeah. And so I do appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so kind of introduce yourself. Like where did you, where, where are you from? And yeah. So, and actually Ian has the opposite experience cause he lives next door to me. So he oh. knows. Right. Yeah. So every, I get a little, I get a little piece of John staying every day, every day <laughs> before after a class. It's, I did uh, notice he was losing weight. So, Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was a dad joke. Uh, that was a terrible dad joke. I'm just prepared for ordination. So on to the actual question. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, so I'm so just to let everyone know I'm I'm in second theology currently, and I'm studying for the Dodge City, Kansas diocese. Where is um, Dodge City? Dodge City is wow. uh, in. S- <laughs> you didn't watch Gunsmoke, apparently. Um, <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> I didn't even really watch Gunsmoke. People just reference it. Uh, <laughs> when, they say, when they say Dodge City, that's the first thing they say. Um, uh, so in, in Kansas, there are four dioceses, and they all cover uh, various quadrants of Kansas. Okay. Uh, and in uh, so Dodge City covers the, the southwest portion of Kansas. So it borders Colorado and Oklahoma. Uh, and Dodge City is the about the geographical center of that. So, mm. and I, I I grew up in in Great Bend, which is on the eastern edge of of the of the diocese. And it's a very it's a very rural diocese. Uh, about forty uh, there's about forty eight parishes there. About twenty four priests. So it's a place wow. we desperately need priests. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. you guys have a couple of great priests that graduated from St. John Vianney. We did. Father Jacob Schneider and yeah. Father Juan Salas. Yes. Um, and both are doing very, very well in, yeah. in parishes. They were doing well here. Those guys are incredible. So Dodge City's lucky to have them. They are. They certainly are. Yeah, and uh, one of our one of our biggest fans is actually from Dodge City. Oh, yes. Is it someone's yeah. mom? Yes. John Stang's mom, actually. <laughs> really? Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, I was talking to my mom yesterday, and she said that she has listened to every episode. Wow. 
Shout out. What's your mother's name? So my mom's name is Kathy. Shout out to Kathy. Kathy. That's Stang. incredible. Thank yeah. you for your support. Yeah, Please she, she loves us. you guys and thinks you do a just a great job. And she was really happy to hear that I was going to be on. Well, <laughs> well, Kathy, so. just so you know, we didn't ask your son on as a pity. We asked him on because we genuinely think he has something to contribute. So <laughs> I had no idea that you listened to the podcast. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in Kansas. Uh, yeah, so I so I was an only child. Like I said, born born and raised Catholic. Uh, and uh, was was very involved in the church. I was a was an altar server. Uh, when I got a little bit older, I was a lector. Ooh. Um, yeah, and actually, I just got installed as an as an institute elector. Okay. Recently, so, so the so church now, now officially it, recognizes your ability to read, which yes, is nice. which is wonder which is wonderful. So it's always been something that's been very close to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> as being a lector. <laughs> All right, so you're a lector in your church growing yes. up. How old were you at that point? Let's see. I was probably about a sophomore in high school, so probably wow. maybe 15 or 16. Nice. Somewhere in there. Um, and, 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 and over time, though, uh, as I was kind of going through uh, my high school years, uh, I started to have a lot of struggles. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I was always a, a very good student academically for most of my life. But then uh, towards the end of high school, I was really starting to struggle, and my, my teachers couldn't really figure out why, why that was the case. Hmm. And I actually di- got diagnosed when I was a senior in high school with ADHD. Wow. Uh, and uh, which was a, which, which, when something like that happens to you, it just really shocks you out of yourself. Sure. Uh, and senior in high school. Senior in high school, yeah. So all those years, I had just really learned how to, really learned how to cope with it. Hmm. Uh, at the same time, too, I was also... Uh, really struggling with finding good friends and sort of find and kind of figuring out what I wanted to kind of what I wanted to wanted to do with my life, uh, and I was sort of making some some poor choices, uh, and I, I realized that I, I needed to change my life in some way. Something needed to happen. Yeah. So so I started to pray. Started to get a little bit more. Uh, started to take my faith. Uh, I was taking my faith seriously before, but I was started to take it more seriously hmm. at, at, at that point. Uh, yeah. By praying more, I joined a, a group called the Dead Theologian Society. That because sounds her, incredible. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it, it's it's like it's well, it's named after the movie Dead Poet Society. Yeah, that's what right, I thought. Right, right, yeah. It's an incredible yeah. film. Uh, and but what, but they but they talk about various saints, and you kind of get together in a dark room and read about saints. It's really cool. Really, really wow. Cool. <laughs> and this is in your small town. That you in our small town, yeah. Wow, oh, town. that's or it was anyway. I think it's morphed since then, but really something else, but. Oh, well, that's an incredible idea. I'm going to have to take that for future ministry. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great thing for, for college or, or high school students. I yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Wow. All right, so you're getting involved, Dead Theologian Society. Mm-hmm. Um, for some reason, you started praying. Started praying more. Yeah. And then uh, one day, I remember dis- distinctively when I got the call to priesthood. I was sitting in my room, and I, was, I have a, a big... Uh, nice, easy reading chair in my room. I like to sit in, and I was reading some book. I don't remember what it was. It was either some dead theologian. Some yeah. Some. <laughs> I think it honestly was. I think it was honestly some life of the saint, the life of the saints, or or scripture. And I just had the thought come to my mind: What does it take to be a saint? Like, what is like? How do you achieve that? Hmm. Uh, and the Lord spoke to me in that moment and said, "I want you to be a priest." I was like, whoa, I want to do everything, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. I think we, we can agree with that. We've yeah, there. definitely. Yeah, it, it really, it really, it really scared me. It was something that was very hard for me to, to really wrap my, to really wrap my mind around. Wow. Wow. That clear as day, huh? Uh, yeah. it's a moment I, I still think about quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. How those go. We've talked in the podcast about kind of those experiences of prayer when you, you know, people always ask like, well, what's God's voice like? And you're like, well, if I could describe it, I would. You know, right. it's, it's, but it's, it's a, it's a, you're, it's an experience that you're outside of yourself. You're outside of time and you hear that voice and you know, it's true. You know, it's clear as day, but it's, it's hard to describe that to people sometimes. It is. And say Ignatius of Loyola talks about there's different modes of discernment. And that's exactly. w- one of them is the first mode, which is basically the St. Paul thing where you get struck by, by lightning essentially. Yeah. Uh, but most people that doesn't happen to a lot of times it's, it's just, you just hear a very small voice in your head and get God speaks in a very silent, um, in a very silent way, I think. Yeah. Right. Most, mo- most of the time. Yeah. But you're blessed with that. Yes. 
with that lightning strike, so to speak. So. Yes, it certainly was. Awesome. All right, so then, you didn't mean, don't leave us at a cliffhanger. Do you enter seminary <laughs> yeah, the next day? We're the podcast right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. One thing led to another, and now he's here. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> uh, so I, I, I did... I did think I, I did think about because at that point I think I was I think it was like February of my senior year, so I was uh, of high school, so I was still debating about what I wanted to do for college, and uh, and I already had some college plans basically picked out, uh, but seminary was not one of those. Right. Uh, but I, but my mom convinced me, you know, I, I you should go talk to the vocations director and and maybe see where this might lead. So I went to talk with our vocations director at the time, and he said uh, maybe you should wait a little bit before you go to seminary. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you're a little young, and, and, and I think in hindsight he was definitely right about that. I just wasn't, I had the call, but I don't think I had the maturity yet to really pursue it and to, to really go forward with it. And so I, I decided to, to go to college, and I, I went to college actually uh, very far away from Kansas. People are gonna be really surprised where mm -hmm. I went to school. I went to Roanoke College, which is in Salem, Virginia, of all yeah. places. Oh wow! My yeah. cousin lives in Roanoke. It's freaking beautiful. Yes, it is. It's in the. It's a small liberal arts college, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it's just a. It's a. It's a great place. Yeah, it's like a rock climbing capital. Yes. A, a wow. Lot, lot. Lot. Lot of good hiking. It's on the Appalachian Trail. Oh yeah. So. Wow. Uh, it's quite now different. was that was that you were were you growing up was that were you kind of a homebody was that your first time outside of. I, I, I traveled around, but no, I had not lived in, I had not lived anywhere else okay. other, other than that. Wow. Um, so I went to a place that I, I really didn't know anybody, and I really didn't have any fr any family or friends that were really there. And the reason I, I chose to go there was because I wanted to go. I had this vision in my head that I wanted to go back east to school for some reason. I don't know oh. why. That was just a really big thing for me. Hmm. Uh, and originally, I was going to go to to Washington to D.C. for for school. Uh, I wanted to pursue maybe a career in politics or something like that. I think the Lord protected you from that. I think he did too, actually. <laughs> Inside looking, June 2020. Looking back on it. Uh, but, when I, but when I got there, I, uh, I, 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 I thrived. Um, I was part of the honors program. I was uh, involved in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different activities. Uh, one of the activities I, I got involved in were well, two things, actually. Uh, one was my, my college newspaper. Um, huh. I did some writing, and I also did some news editing for them. And then I also got involved in our college radio station wow. as well. Right. Was it called the Roanoke Rambler? It was not, no. Or, Please tell me it was called the Stang. <laughs> no. 106.5, the Stang. The Stang. <laughs> <laughs> the wow. best morning zoo show you'll ever hear. Wow. So this <laughs> is not your first experience in a studio. No, it's not. And it's I bet you had a way nicer studio than this one. Yeah, this is this is literally uh, a closet your, with a table in it. Your studio is actually, you know, a, it's, our studio was not was not much better than this. Wow, it was really? Surprising. Yeah, it was. It was kind of it was kind of in this cramped room on the second floor of our of our campus activity center. You are literally describing the room that we're sitting Which in, which is right much now. what we're in now. <laughs> I think I think after I left, they've I've seen pictures. They actually built a really nice studio in a, in really? a different different building, but. Um, it, but it took time and probably some funding to be able to do that. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Wow. So you're a radio host. All right, take it away. Yeah. So that's incredible. <laughs> yes. Uh, it was. Maybe a, we should have asked him instead yeah, of Tony. I mean. Seriously, you're way more qualified than I am. <laughs> it was a. It, it was. It was a. It was a political show. So I would. I would talk about uh, political issues, and also I would uh, interview guests. We had usually professors or students of things that were going on. It was an hour a week. It was called In the Know with John Stang. That's okay. incredible, though. Yeah. So you had your own talk show. I did. I did have my own talk show. Um, and I, th I thought radio might be a career that I might want to go into. Um, actually, that was the hard part, uh, was the fact that I, I I had a lot of different interests in college. I, I did radio. Um, I was very heavily involved in academic research. Um, I thought I might want to pursue being like a hi history was my major. That's what my major ended up being. Wow. And so I thought I might want to be a history professor. Um, I thought maybe print journalism might be something I might want to do. So I just had all these various interests and priesthood was not one of those. <laughs> really? uh, it, it just, it didn't seem like it was God. I think it was God's plan for my life, but it was definitely not the plan that I had envisioned for my life. Yeah. And I think that was something that I had a hard time really, really understanding. Right. Wow. 
Uh, it, and it, it took God to really kind of push to put to really push back against that. Yeah, and so so what what was that kind of that tipping point for you then? Yeah. Uh, so like you're in college and you're just kind of there being yeah. a star on your own radio show. <laughs> Well, it, it actually didn't come until, I mean, the poking and the prodding kept coming while I was in college. Um, I even had two professors, one of them Catholic, the other one not Catholic, uh, who, who thought I would make a good priest. And so whenever people would say that, I would be like, oh, no, don't let's yeah. talk about something else. Anything, <laughs> anything else. Don't say that. And, uh, uh, and, and it, was that, it was really after college uh, then that I, that I really actually made that, made that leap. Um, when I got done, I graduated in 2013 from college and I worked, uh, for about a year and a half, I decided to, to try, uh, to try print journalism. Hmm. Uh, so I worked for a small weekly newspaper near where I went to school. It's called the Smith Mountain Eagle. Uh, and, uh, I ended up being a reporter covering basically everything <laughs> that was around except for sports. We didn't really do sports. And I, and I, I, but I cover crime, politics, education, wow. basically anything. And I also was in charge of uh, doing newspaper layout as okay. well, which I had like basically no skills at really doing. <laughs> and then I, and then on top of that, sometimes I would even deliver the newspapers. Wow. Well, so you're so, going to, you're going to make a sweet bulletin when you're a pastor one day. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> the, the coolest layout. We'll see. That's going to be awesome. All right. Well, so, so, so I'm good. doing that. I'm, I'm, work and I really and I really like the work that I do. It was very, very creative. Yeah. Uh but the problem was I was just not satisfied with it. Uh and I wasn't satisfied in the sense that I think I, I had a, a career or a job, but I didn't have but I didn't have a vocation. <laughs> right. Uh I didn't and when I when I as I was kind of discerning and praying and I was I was attending also my my, my local parish as well. I started to really feel that sense of, uh, I started to think about priesthood a little more in terms of a vocational status. I also at that time went to a, a wedding of, of some friends of mine as well. And, and it just made me really think about it in a different way. I, I, but I always felt that there was something missing in my life and only God was going to be able to, to, fi to fill that. Mm. And I think like a lot of guys though, you you kind of go through that bargaining stage with God, right. yeah. <laughs> We're like, well, I, well, well I, I won't go to seminary, but maybe I, maybe I can be uh, maybe I can be elector at my at my church, which I did do it in Virginia too, or it's maybe I can be a Eucharistic minister or something else, uh, or is there some other way I can satisfy this? Yeah, right. Then go to sure. seminary, uh, huh. and and God basically was like, no, <laughs> there's not. You're gonna have to go to seminary. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like that clear, but it but it seemed like that was the direction that he was really really pointing me towards. Wow. And I felt, and I also felt a call too to not only go to seminary, but I felt a, a call to come back and to be in a rural area. Hmm. Um, and, it, and and Tony's been been up there. The, it, it, it's it's kind of a Bedford and Roanoke in that area is kind of a rural area in yeah. a lot of ways. Uh, and our diocese is not quite mountainous like that. It's actually the opposite of that. <laughs> but, it, but, it, but, but it is, but it, but it is very rural. And so yeah. I felt that I felt that 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 the Lord was calling me to come back to the Dodge City Diocese and uh, and to wow. and to serve there. So. Praise God! I mean, that's just incredible, mm -hmm. right? Um, because so many people, wherever they receive that call, and I think maybe that's why you're back in Dodge City because you initially received a call there that we run away from. Yes. Right? And then we bargain. But so many people, like myself included, you know, wherever we receive that call, that becomes home. Right. Right. And there's nothing you can do about it. Right. It's just kind of you receive this call and your life has changed, whether you like it or not. And it sounds like that call followed you, you know, all the way across the country to the mountains of the Appalachian, you know, the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and it followed you and beckoned you home. I think that's right. Yeah. I, I think what happens a lot of times is you always think in order for me to be successful, I have to go somewhere else. Like mm -hmm. I, I can't be in, at least this is the way that I think, maybe other people might think of it differently, but you think I have to go somewhere else to be successful. Yeah. And I realized that no, going home is, I think sometimes the place where God wants you to be successful. He put, he puts you in a specific place 
for a specific reason. And yeah. growing up there and just knowing the people there, it, it felt like home to me once I once I once I came back. And it and I and by but but by but by, but by being far away, I, I saw it in a whole new light when I got back. I saw yeah. things that I didn't necessarily see before. I had a greater appreciation for uh, for for things. And, and it, yeah, it was really it was really I, I really appreciated the fact that I had that experience of living far away from home because I think it may be more grateful when I, when I got back. Yeah. Um, in one of the past podcasts, it was actually the one on ontological poverty with Matt. Right. Um, you guys talked, Matt goes, he had this classic line that I really loved. And I think more people need to hear this of like, you know, he's like, well, I, I didn't really have a prodigal son moment, you know, where I, you know, was gone and I was falling into all this crazy sin. He's like, I was always just Catholic. Right. And then I grew closer to the Lord. And I think it's so beautiful because everyone can identify. That's why the, that story is so powerful, the prodigal son. And that's what I hear here. Like you physically, you did go away from home. And then you returned home and received, not only by your family, I'm sure, because your, your mom sounds like an incredible woman. Like I'm sure she was so happy to have her son back. <laughs> um, oh. But you received by your diocese, your home, your spiritual home, Right, received you back. And it wasn't like, well, John, how was the Appalachian Trail? You know, it's like, no, you had a home. You had a place you could go to to talk about your vocation, your your passion for God, and your insecurities, your fears. Hey, I'm back here. You know, where do you want me to go? This and that. Um, but I think everyone, the prodigal son story is so powerful to me because we all fit into it at every point in our lives. You can look at the prodigal son story. You can be like, well, that's me. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. You can be a different person in the story. Right. And you can always identify with it. Um, and I just find that fascinating because every, that's kind of one of the things when I listen to people's stories, I kind of think of the prodigal son. Mm-hmm. And I think, wow, is he the father? Is he the older brother? Is he the younger brother? Is he the servant? You know, you just kind of, that's, that's one of the lenses in which I look at people's vocation. Um, so I just think that's kind of fascinating. Um, you can always tie in somehow. It's right. very interesting. I never looked at it that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's incredible. So you made this decision to return home. Mm-hmm. So you go back to Dodge City, right? You had this light bulb moment. It's apparently, that's what it sounds like. But what, what pushed you over the edge? to? Because the Lord pushed you over the edge when you were in high school and then when you were in college. He pushed you over. He, he gave you that in the parish of this, like, I don't have a vocation. I have a job which I think is really powerful because a lot of people and a lot of stories you hear in the seminary, that's how it is. It's like, yeah, I was living my life and I just didn't really feel like I had a place. I had a good job, had a girlfriend or whatever it was, but I wasn't happy. But, and every time we always just go to, so then I joined seminary. Right. (laughs) But it's like, there's a big step between have a successful job in a newspaper, living across country to moving home and joining the seminary. Like that's a big step, you know? Yeah. Yes, it is. And yeah, and and oddly enough, it happened uh, pretty. It actually, happened kind of fast. <laughs> so I started seriously, really praying about it and thinking about it again. Uh, in it was like October, and uh, late October, and then I, uh, but 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 I sat on it again for uh, maybe a couple months. It was maybe December, or January before I finally had the courage to to call my my vocations director uh who at that who it actually had changed between the first time when i talked to my vocations director and the second time my the new vocations director uh i mean by the name of father wesley shawe uh was actually a priest in my home parish when i was in high school so i knew him i had a relationship Mm -hmm. with him previously uh so that was really nice because he he sort of knew me and i knew him so that's that that was very helpful and as I was talking with him, one of the thing, and I remember this phone call very distinctly. One of the things that he told me, because I asked him, I think, what's one of your f- favorite things about being a priest? And one of the things that he said was, every single day I get to do something a little bit different. There's such a variety in my day. Hmm. And that just really hit me because I'm, I'm someone who also likes, I like things to be the same, I been. I like having a schedule, but I also like having variety. I like to be able to do a lot of different things. Yeah. And so I felt the diocesan priesthood was really, okay, I think this is the Lord, where the Lord is actually like really pulling me in, mm-hmm. that I get to do all of these different things, yeah. that the Lord is eventually going to use my gifts and my talents uh, 
and in in whatever way that he's gonna whatever way that he's gonna do it yeah but to to get a little more specifically into your sort of your your point after after that i i uh i I went through i decided all right i'm gonna go through the application process so i so i so i did that and that takes maybe about three months to do in our diocese yeah filling out the application applying the diocese i had to come back and interview with my uh interview with my bishop vocations director we have a lay committee that you also uh, and lay and religious committee you meet with Mm. Uh, and then uh, Father Wesley also had to meet with my parents as well. Wow. Uh, and we went out to dinner together, and he would answer any questions that that, that they had. So I, I did that portion of it, did my psychological evaluation and, 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 and all that. And then when I finally got accepted by the diocese, uh, and most of your, many of your listeners probably know this, but some may not know this, You're, you, you apply to the diocese first, and then a diocese or a religious order has to accept you. And then once they accept you, then, then you, then you have to reapply again to the seminary. Yeah. So you have right. to do it's two separate institutions. Unless basically. Yeah. you study for the archdiocese of Denver in which it's just vetted and you're just in. If right. You get because it's oh, really? the seminary and the diocese are the same. Yeah. I mean, we run the <laughs> seminary. So well, that, see, that makes sense. Yeah. When you're from, when you're from the outside foreign diocese, yes. you have to, yes. uh, you have to, you, you have to do a little more extra work. But luckily, the application was almost the exact same. So right. it was very easy. It didn't take long at all. I just had to do a few extra, do a few extra things. Uh, the, one, the most difficult part I thought was going to be, uh, because while I'm doing all this, I haven't told any of my coworkers <laughs> at the newspaper what? that I was applying to do this. You at least told your parents. Though. I told my parents knew. Okay, my parents knew uh, and maybe and some close relatives and, and I think some, and some friends knew, but, but I, but I didn't, but I hadn't told my coworkers yet. Wow. So, so they just thought you were like visiting family at home or something. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, basically. Yes. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, you know, not that I was trying to be really secretive about what I was doing, but I, but I, but I, but I just hadn't really told them yet, yet what I was, what I was applying for. So yeah, for sure. once I, and so eventually I go into, uh, my editor's office and I tell her, and she's very supportive of it and all of my coworkers are actually very supportive of it eventually. It was very surprised which is very surprising. Yeah. Because I don't think any of them I don't think I don't think any of them were Catholic. And then I, I basically because I still had an apartment and everything else, I I sold everything that I had or had to get rid of everything that I had. And I basically just took with me what I could fit in my my little Subaru Impreza. <laughs> but then once I once I came to seminary in that fall in, in the fall, I it, it entered spirituality year uh, everything just really began to, to click and, and confirm what I already, what the Lord had already been putting on my heart. You know, it was just uh, that, that this is where I belonged and the diocesan priesthood was really where he, he wanted me to, really where he wanted me to be. So Yeah, I think, I think you, you hit something that's very important and that people kind of ignore a lot in that, you know, you talked about, and there might be a connection with this, you know, ADHD and I myself have, you know, I struggle with ADD, ADHD. I'm always going crazy, right? But something that is beautiful that I didn't know before I entered seminary, but about the diocesan priesthood is that, just like your vocation director said, every day I get to do something different. Mm-hmm. And it's not mm-hmm. like every day I change the Eucharistic prayer however I want it. You know, like <laughs> that's, not, that's not what we're talking that's about. That's not here. what we mean. Um, so the diocesan priesthood really is the front line. Right. We don't have a choice. We have to, if we want to be, you know, truly priests after the heart of Jesus Christ, we have to be pursuing him at every moment, which means we're serving in the soup kitchen. We're preaching the homilies. We're studying. Um, we're available for sick calls. We're available for whatever the people need. Right. Um, that diocesan and priest is a priest of service. If you don't want to serve, you can't do that. You, right. You're not called to the diocesan and priesthood. I hate to say it. Right, you have to die to yourself every day. And the great diocesan priest, you see it in your diocese. He's the priest that wakes up at two a.m. to go to the sick call. He's the priest that goes out to dinner with, you know, or out to breakfast after the eight a.m. mass on Fridays with, you know, the elderly community, even though he's you know maybe thirty, but he goes out to be with his people, right? Um, he sacrifices everything that he prefers, everything that he wants, to serve the people that are put in front of him by God. Right. So in Dodge City, I'm sure every parish is different. I'm sure there's similarities, but I'm sure there every person, every community is different. 
right? I think I think I think you said it exactly right. Uh, that today's diocesan priest has to be a priest that is willing to do a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, there might be certain things that you're you're gifted with, or things that you could specialize in. But for the most part, you're going to have to be someone who says daily mass every day. Uh, on top of maybe if you have a you know go go visit go visit the school children and, yeah. and give and give a catechesis lesson, uh, go to the nursing home and and bring communion, um, even tackle uh, what's the old problem of lights, locks, and leaks in your parish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to do maintenance things. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. And I. But I, but, I, but I think the Lord will give you the grace to be able to do all of those things. So even if you're someone who says, oh, I'm not gifted in all those areas and can't do everything, well, don't worry, you're in good company because neither can anybody else. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and even if you have something that you really like doing, and for me, uh, as I mentioned a few different times in, in, uh, during this podcast, you know, I always imagine myself doing having certain gifts and talents are just things that things that I really liked doing. And I'm like, well, how is the Lord going to use this? How is the Lord going to use me like wanting to write news articles? How is he going to use me being able to do research? How is he going to use me being able to, you know, do radio broadcasts or, 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 or whatever? Uh, well, the radio broadcast thing you're obviously seeing right now. <laughs> being on here, so. This is the fruit of it. This is actually another audition. So <laughs> sons of ours, John Stang. Um, but I, I've written newspaper articles for my for my diocesan newspaper uh, a few different a few different times, both kind of straight news and also some some editorial opinion, uh, and 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 also too the Lord has shown me uh, even in things that I was really scared of doing, uh, He's given me the grace to be able to do them. I was really scared to do uh, hospital ministry. Actually, yeah. I didn't think mm-hmm. I could go visit the sick for some reason. That was just not something that really made a lot of sense to me. Uh, but, uh, I, I've been able to do hospital ministry is that was one of my apostolates, uh, at the seminary. And I just loved it. I just loved going into hospital rooms and visiting people and praying with people. And I did not think that was going to be the case at all. And I've just had some amazing experiences, uh, with that. I didn't think I'd ever do homeless ministry either, but I was, but I was in Samaritan house. I never thought I'd teach religious education, but I'm doing that, doing that for my second year in a row. So... The Lord will give you the grace to do those things, and He'll show you, even in your 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 weakest spots. That's where He'll, as Saint Paul says, "My weakness is my is strength in Christ." You right. Know, if I can rely on Christ and be dependent on Him, that's going to be where my that's going to be where my where my strength is. Hmm. Yeah, my mine was always prison ministry. That was the one I always struggled with. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I just remember because I got that as a summer assignment. Uh, after I entered seminary, but it was back in my diocese and mm-hmm. it was the same kind of thing. I just, uh, the Lord like provides you with the grace. Uh, and not only, uh, do you become capable, um, through the Lord of working in that ministry, but the Lord tends to, uh, make you like it mm-hmm. yeah, and want it. Right. It's, yeah. I'll never forget on my poverty immersion. I was in a homeless shelter and, um, uh, I was convinced I wasn't called to the priesthood. It's my first year of seminary. And we do this 30 day poverty immersion from January to February, where you go two by two to different places around the country. Um, it's a kind of secret. We don't, we try not to tell people where we went just mm-hmm. in case a guy you know enters the seminary here. Uh, but I was in a homeless shelter and the guy I was with was super dynamic. He could, and in, in, in more than dynamic, he was well catechized which I just wasn't. I just didn't take in my catechesis that my mom, you know, taught me and this and that. So we'd be in a situation and yeah, I'd be hanging out with the guys on the patio, but you know, there's Chad over there, like some guys in tears. Cause he just quoted all of this 150 Psalms from memory, you know, so like something crazy <laughs> like that. That's a total exaggeration, but I just felt utterly unprepared and unqualified to be a priest. And I was convinced I was not called because the guy I'm with on immersion is way smarter, way better at quoting the Bible, knew more about the catechism, all this stuff, right? And I was just convinced. Yep, Lord, you're right. I'm not good enough. And you know what the Lord said to me on the third day? You're right. You're not good enough. But I called you, right? 
And that's why yeah. it's your job to study, to prepare, but to love me and pursue my heart at all times. Right? Because Tony, you are not good enough. <laughs> and that's and it's it's funny because if people are like, <gasps> God doesn't say that to you, and I'm like, but it's true, right? Like right. we're sinners. Mm-hmm. We have faults. Like John, Ian, and I are all totally different, but for some reason we're gathered around a table all pursuing the priesthood because Jesus Christ has called us. And we will fulfill his ministry in a totally different way, in a unique way. But we will have the same mission, the exact same mission. And we it is in those sins, it's in our poverty, it's in our you know, lack of trust, it's in our um, frail, human frailty that we become priests of Jesus Christ. Because, because we have to surrender those things to him. Mm-hmm. In order to be successful priests, and successful is you know, what does that mean as far as priesthood goes? But in order to serve people, you have to lay down your life. You have to lay down, Lord, at the foot of the cross. Here are my struggles. Here's my sin. Here is my frailty. Right. And my family saying, "Take me, break me, and make me into the priest you desire for me to be." Right. And I feel like we all have to do that. Um, within our vocation story, within our life, and for the rest of our lives. Yeah, definitely. There's a really great uh, video we just watched in Pastoral Theology uh, that I encourage listeners to to look up. It's uh, was it was that was it that that video? No, I've I haven't seen that video. Okay, uh, it's a, it, it's called are it's called Are You Weak Enough? I think it's the title of it, and it's a Filipino uh, bishop. It's only seven minutes. It's a seven-minute homily given on a priesthood ordination day, and he basically goes through. He basically says, "Asks the guys, are you weak enough to be a priest?" And it's the, the it's much more eloquently put than anything I I could describe. But it's basically saying, you know, your weakness is what's going to make you a good priest. You admitting in your humility that's what's going to make you a great priest, because then God's grace can come through, and and work in you. Yeah. But but if you don't have that, then it's going to be really difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like yeah, like no one wants a pastor or a priest who is perfect and's got has it all figured out, mm-hmm. right? We all want a priest, and I speak this as a seminarian, but also when I was a, you know growing up and when I was in college, I want a priest who is honest with me, and who like I can trust and know that he prays and he has given his life to Jesus, because. Anytime you get someone who's perfect, you always have that something deep down inside you saying like, well, what's really going on? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's something fake here because no one's perfect at all. And this is what gets back to that ontological poverty you guys talked about in the last podcast. I mean, unless you recognize that, that you're not perfect and that Jesus Christ is the font, you know, the fountain of all blessing, of all goodness, of everything that is, that is going on in my life, you'll fail. Right. Well, and, and, and honestly, you're what the Lord shows you is that like, so he talks about in scripture, you know, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Um, and, and, and once you finally make that surrender, you realize that life is so much easier. It's so much simpler with the Lord. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it definitely comes with its struggles. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, uh like the cross, <laughs> right, right. But again, at the same time, uh, when you're giving your entire life over to somebody, you're giving everything over, you're giving uh, total control over uh, to somebody else, to, to, to the Lord, um, and surrendering everything, uh, what is there to worry about, right? Yeah. Like, that's, what a life, right? Yeah. And, and one of my favorite sayings that I've been saying a lot recently that is really crude and out of context, you would think that I was just like, an awful person, but I tell people all the time when they're complaining about something that's going on or they're like, man, this, this coffee sucks or whatever it is. And I'm like, Hey man, life's a lot better when you have low expectations. <laughs> and, and when you hear that, it sounds offensive to the ears, right? Right. But what I mean by that is life is a lot better when you're just open to the will of God. Right. Because we have our expectations. Right. We have our demands like John in his story, you know, like, no, I don't want to go be a priest. I'm going to, you know, he moved far away and I'm going to do this. I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to pursue this. And the Lord's sitting there the whole time like, hey, man, I've given you your plan. But because a lot of times we just say like, no, that's not mine. Like that's that's beneath me or that's different than my plan. So therefore, I'm not going to pursue it. 
right? But even in our day-to-day life, it doesn't have to be something vocation-wise. Like, like St. Alphonso Liguori says this. He has this little pamphlet called The Uniformity of God's Will, and it's changed my life uh, for the past six years. Um, but he says, you know, we praise God. Uh, one blessed be God in times of trial is better than a thousand blessed be gods in times of of, um, of goodness, of, of right. blessing. Right. So when the coffee sucks, you know, you say, blessed be God. This is your will for me, Lord. When it starts raining and you're walking in from your house, blessed be God. Right. Right. And it's that uniformity with God's will that we start to then be able to make that uniformity in the larger things. Right. Right. And that's the key. That's the key. Like, John, what was the first step when you were kind of going down the wrong path when you were in high school? You said you started doing one thing. um, Praying. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Boom. Who would have thought? (laughs) Right? When you start talking to God, that's when good things will happen. Because (laughs) because he'll respond. He'll respond. I mean, he does. And and we just, we, we ask, we demand so many things of God. But we're not willing to compromise our personal preferences, our likings. We're not even willing to talk to him a lot of times. You know, we'll complain about our life. We'll complain about our situation. But do we even talk to God? Right. You know. Um, kind of building off that, one thing that I wanted to to read really quick, uh, because I think it's just divine providence that I got this today. I was I was praying about what I wanted to talk about on the show. And, uh, and I knew I was, we were going to maybe talk about surrender, divine providence. And I open up a letter that I get from a Dominican sister of peace, which is the, a religious order in my diocese, in nice. my hometown, actually. And in the, the letter, she, she just thanks me for, for, for my vocational call and says she's praying for me. But she also sends me this uh, homily of this recently deceased priest uh, in, our, in our diocese. And it's about a small paragraph and i knew this was the holy spirit speaking saying you need to read this on the air to to uh, to really kind of accentuate some of the points we're talking about so the only thing i ask is if, if everyone could pray for uh the, the repose of the soul of father marvin rife and also for his family uh, uh that w- that would be great because he's the the name of the, the priest who delivered this right, this say his name one more time his name is father marvin rife okay um He's a former priest from the from the uh, diocese. He's a deceased priest from the diocese of Dodge City. So his homily reads: As we know, God's wisdom is so different than our wisdom. His ways are far above our ways. His thoughts above our thoughts. What does this teach us? It teaches us lots of patience, and it teaches us surrender, trust, and hope. If we want to pray hard and pray well, we need to pray correctly. And it is a very easy way to pray. St. Paul makes it sound difficult by saying that we are to pray always. It's the simple prayer of Mary. When the angel came to her in the Annunciation, and that is the prayer, thy will be done. Many times it is hard at first, but it becomes easy when we understand and believe that God always has the perfect plan for our lives. And yes, even in the struggles and the situations in which we find ourselves, he has a perfect plan for your life, and that plan is sometimes oh so different than your plan. Surrender to him and let his holy will guide you in all things. And I just think that's a really perfect summary of what we've been talking about. You know, that God's wisdom is so much bigger than you know, and if we surrender to that will and we ask and we just simply say, thy will be done, that's when wonderful things are going to start happening in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, like, uh, um, that just reminds me, uh, and, and I had mentioned it on the last podcast again, uh, with, uh, with Matt Christians, but of the surrender novena. Right. And yeah. I've just been, uh, really getting into that. Uh, I, I only encountered this really a couple weeks ago when, when our house father gave it to us but he really encourages cur- encouraged us to pray it uh, going into the new year, right? Don't have any expectations, especially for Tony and I. You know, this is our uh, last year uh, before we potentially, uh, God willing, receive the diaconate, right? So Pray for us. Right, seriously. Um, and so going into this year with that mentality is super important, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and one of the things that uh, really blew me away uh, when I read, when I went through this novena, because I'd never really heard it before, 
um, is, uh, I'm not going to bother to try to pronounce the name of the priest that wrote it. Just look it up. But um, he mentions uh, to treat thoughts and anxieties of the future as temptations to sin. You treat those in the same way. So when Tony and I, when we're sitting dwelling on, oh my gosh, diaconate is almost, it, you know, it's close. Yeah. That's like, treat it as you would a temptation to sin yeah. and abandon everything to the Lord. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just made all the difference for, for this year. Right. Um, and you know, it, it's a whole novena. So there's, you know, nine days worth of wisdom in this thing. Um, I highly suggest that you look it up if you're interested, but, uh, but yeah, just this idea of, um, uh, like most of our lives, the the things in our lives that cause anxiety, that cause distress, that that cause us to, uh, yeah, yeah, um, are all things that we dwell on um, that are not of God, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it be in the future or whether it be in the past, and that that's what the devil's trying to do. He's trying to distract you from the present. He's trying to distract you from from being carried in the arms of our Lord yeah. um, and not trying to, you know, another thing that mentions in the, in the novena is stop trying to be a child that asks his mother for help and then tries to do it himself without yeah. his mother's help. It's like, that's so annoying. Just be the child that asks for his mother's help and then lets his mother actually help him. You yeah. know, like when he's trying to put on his own diaper or something, it's yeah. <laughs> and people, they complain all the time. They're like, yeah, well, I'm trying. I'm just sitting in the moment and I'm resting with Jesus and this and that. But I, I don't know what decision to make. I have to make a decision. And I say, good, then make one small decision. Call the vocation director. Ask that girl out on a date. <laughs> you know, <laughs> apply for that job. That's a small decision that we can make. Right. And the Lord opens doors and you, you go through them. That's how our life works. And if you're unified right. with God's will, you can't make a bad choice. Right. right? Um, but that takes prayer, discernment, spiritual direction, the sacraments, all of these things. They tie together. Adoration. Adoration. Right. So if you're doing these things, you know, you're praying actively, you're close to the sacraments, you have a spiritual director, this and that. Your discernment is not rocket science. Right. You're doing very good things. And if you're honest and genuine with yourself and with your, your priest and you know, or your spiritual director, whoever it is, you cannot make a bad decision. But you still have to make one. And maybe all that decision that you have to make is going to be texting somebody, calling somebody, going to the church for the first time in 40 years. <laughs> Whatever it is. Yeah. Like Those are small decisions if we think about it. But you have to make one. Right, and then you see where the Lord takes you, um, and that's why I, I love uniformity with God's will. I just think it's so important. Um, you can call it ontological poverty. You can call it uniformity with God's will. You can call it following Jesus on a hiking trail. I don't know, like <laughs> follow, call it whatever you want, but you cannot live the Christian life unless you you have some degree of of this involved. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and. Uh, I think I think that is really the biggest thing that we wanted to take away um, from today, um, especially for you young men and women out there who are discerning a potential vocation. You know, whether it be uh, to priesthood, religious life, um, you know, marriage. to marriage too, uh, but but especially to priesthood because I think that is really what guys uh, wrestle with a lot. You know, yeah. um, and and women like with their religious vocation. So many women tell me all the time like man, it's so easy for you guys. You know, you, you just have the seminary here in Denver and you can go visit. And I'm like, you're right. You know, I don't tell them they're wrong because they are right. Right. It's really hard for women to discern religious life now. There's so many communities and a lot of dioceses. There's not, there or there's not. In Denver, we're very blessed. Mm-hmm. You can go visit all these communities. So when women tell me that here, I say, you're right. We are, as men, we are very blessed. But have you tried anything? Right. Have you called the Dominican sisters at St. Vincent de Paul, right? Have you called the poor Clares? Have you called the Carmelites in Littleton? Have you called, you know, we have so many religious right. communities here in Denver. I'm sorry that I can't shout you all out. Nashville, Dominicans. Yeah. Those are close to my heart. They're connected with my brother's province on the East Coast. Yeah. But we have so many women's religious communities here. 
And it's not rocket science. Just because you call him doesn't mean you're joining. Right. right? The same with the vocation director. You call Father Ryan O'Neill for the Diocese of Denver, Archdiocese of Denver, you're not, it doesn't mean you have an application and you're applying. Right. It's that one phone call. Figure out, and if they're hard to deal with, maybe the Lord's shutting that door. Right. And that's the thing. Right? Like, the trust yeah. in the Lord that he will shut that door if you go down that path. You know, it's like, yeah. It also takes it out of the abstract mm-hmm. because right. I, I think yeah. where a lot of people get stuck is, man, I can't, you know, I just, I, I, I don't know where to go with this priesthood thing. Or I, I, you know, man, I can't make that call. And they give X, Y, and Z reason. And I think the evil one also works into that too. But if you just take that step, it takes it out of the abstract and it makes it concrete. And I think for me, that was, uh, that was one of the most important things was if I, if I just take those, and most of the steps that you were talking about, Tony, are just very small steps in the present moment that you have. Yeah. Right. You can't think really far down into the future because you, because God's thinking about that. You don't have to think about that. <laughs> so exactly. if, as long as you, but if you take the small steps, th- that that's going to be where good things will start happening. And like you said, either for me, it was doors just started to open. And if, and if you find the doors are opening, that's probably a good sign. If doors are just not opening, it's, you know, maybe, maybe that's not where the Lord wants you to go. Yeah. Right. And it's those small steps that can take you from a small town of Roanoke, Virginia, all the way to Denver, Colorado for the past five years to pursue a priesthood, um, the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So John, we thank you so much uh, for being on the show. Uh, for sharing your story, your life, your vocation, um, and how you pursued the Lord's will for your life and are continuing to do that every day because it doesn't end once you enter seminary. Right. We continue to pursue it. It only begins. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah. So Ian and I are at a crossroads here. I don't know how to end this podcast. I'm not... Yeah, Jacob and I, we were trying to fight the, the, the Mike and Ian ending, so Ian, I'll let you have this. <laughs> well, yeah, we uh, we just want to thank you all for uh, continuing to listen to us. Uh, and uh, remember, if you, in case you missed the last episode, we have the new email address. Um, so don't email at us at the SJV at Denver um, because we, we have our own specific podcast email. Um, so if you have any complaints, thoughts, feelings, desires, just let us know. Yeah. If you need a copy of that Surrender Novena. Yeah. Or if you need a copy of Uniform Media with God's Will by Alfonso Ligori, shoot us an email. We'll send you We'll one. send you something. Sweet. And what's that email again? Yeah. So it's uh, sonsofourspodcast at gmail.com. So make sure and just uh, shoot us an email and we'll respond as soon as we can. We can post that to our Facebook page too. Yeah, Facebook, and we need to update the website too. But sweet, so you can find that there. Yeah, thank you uh, for listening to Sons of Ours podcast. Thanks. I'm not That's saying that. Ours with Don't a. Stop it. See y'all next time.